Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of In My World podcast. In My World podcast is a father and son podcast run by 20 Talk, where we we investigate people's lives and we understand different mental health discoveries that have happened in the last 12 months. Really care about people and discovering these little golden nuggets that they find in their life. And today we have on Zandra, who's a psychologist in Fremantle, and we're going to be learning a little bit about her story, a little bit about what she's learned over the last 12 months. Not in a psychology perspective, but more on a personal perspective. And that's what I think we really want to distinguish today. This is about you as an individual and what you're learning about. So to get started, just like to learn a little bit about you. Who are you and what shapes you? Thanks for having me. So my name is Zandra and I'm a psychologist in Fremantle, like you said. Yeah, so live locally and yeah. And how long have you been a psychologist for and why did you decide to become a psychologist? So I'm pretty early career. Yeah. Um, I, I've been registered for just over a year now. Oh. So started my journey probably, probably like 2015. So cool. moved over to Melbourne to do all of my studies, which mm-hmm. was really good. And I was actually considered, I think... A mature age student is over 21. So I was pretty young. So I was a mature age student. Um, I had a total pivot from I was studying law previously and I found that okay. um, I, was, I wasn't, my heart wasn't in it. And that was a pretty hard realisation to have, like when you're quite a way yeah. into a degree. Sure. Um, so I think, yeah. you know, it was a really good choice um, professionally and personally. Because I knew that I wanted to work with people, yeah. but just in a different way. Yeah. So. Well, it's good you found out when you did and you didn't get to the end of your law degree. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think drove you as a person to get into a space where you're helping people? I think that, you know, most psychologists, if not all psychologists, have their own experiences of helping people, um, realising that maybe they're kind of good at it. Yeah. or that they have capacity for it. So I think it comes from a combination of, you know, lived experience, um, mm. but wanting to do something with it too. And what we do on the In My World podcast is we actually get the last guest to share a little question, a little investigation, a little question um, with the next person that comes on the po- podcast. And, you know, previously we had Ben Broadbridge come in, who's a mental health first aid instructor, and just over, just all over, incredible human. He's actually given you a little question, so little present, little present, just <laughs> in front of you. We've got a piece of paper, Ooh. and Ooh, it's, it, it's hidden in, <laughs> in a piece of paper. And if you just want to grab that piece of paper now and, and open it up, right. and then just read out the question. Can do. Here we go. Ben asks, "What do you think humans need more or less of?" And what com- <laughs> what comes to your head <laughs> right Dan. now? You know, you don't have to have a perfect answer. This what is coming to your head just in that moment? Bit of word association, free thought. I mean, first thing that comes to mind is less is more. Um, I think about balance. You know, I think about mm. everything in moderation. What are maybe some trends that you see? It could not necessarily be work. It could be in media or just within your circles about what that could look like? Oh, you know, I think something that comes to mind is the very human and valid need for connection, right, with mm. with other people. And yeah. we know that's so innate. Yeah. Um, but I guess, you know, the forms of connection is, is super important. And perhaps we live in a world now where connection is you know, incredibly easy, but, yeah. you know, quality over quantity mm. really when it comes to connecting with others and, mm. um, you know, we can we can be in so many different places at once now, but I think, you know, to be present where you are and to be authentic where you are is going to be a lot more meaningful for the people around you but also for yourself. Yeah, that, that actually brings us back to um, this mental health maintenance course, which 20 Talk's been developing over the last 15 months. And we actually got you involved to help create some of the content for the relationships module. Mm. And 
in that module, you talked a lot about the authenticity of relationships. And do you want to just share a little bit about the importance of that and why you brought that into the course? Yeah, I think, you know, often, you know, and this comes up in in therapy and personally as well, is mm. this idea of being authentic and the impact it can have, um, you know, to show up authentically in your relationships with other people does something for you and for your relationship with yourself. It's kind of, um, you know, we need to be able to start living authentically with ourselves before we can really move into any space with others. Like I always think about, um, you know, in aeroplanes and you get that little information booklet on what to do in an emergency. And um, I remember, I never understood as a kid why it was like put your own mask on first and then put on your kid's mask, (laughs) oxygen Mm -hmm. mask. Um, but now as an adult it makes a lot of sense Mm. you know like if you don't have that solid foundation with yourself you know how can we expect to give to other people or to show up Mm. that's powerful Mm. and I want to talk about you know why we got you on the podcast and as a psychologist your role is largely helping people it's helping people find their discoveries Mm. and I want to know how you felt when we asked you to discover some of your own mental health discoveries instead of you actually facilitating that for other people. Yeah, that's a really good question because it it goes back to what I was saying, right? Um, And I think that's certainly something that I've reflected on. Um, You know, like we can really talk the walk as therapists. You know, we can offer a lot of um, helpful strategies we can, you know, we can be there with our clients and I think that itself is so valuable but we need to be able to walk the talk ourselves too. Um, so what do you think for people that are listening and when you raise that, the importance of being authentic, what do you think? Tell us what your version of what that means because for some people they might be pretty angry at the world or they could be yeah. pretty sad or just feeling a bit pretty shitty so what does that look like that looks like that i think you know i think normalizing that whole like wheel there's you know there's a lot of sort of visuals of the you know um all the different emotions that we might feel and you know we tend to sort of emphasize the positive ones right like we all want to feel good all the time but we're not going to feel good all the time um you know to be authentic when you're feeling really angry when you're feeling really shitty it's it's just as important yeah. to be able to to talk about that. And, you know, I think, of course, we we can develop ways of communicating that that are going to be more, um, you know, effective or adaptive. Yeah. But, yeah, we need to be able to talk about those just as much as when we're feeling good. Mm. Yeah, which is that challenge with social media where people, mm. you don't want to be messy, so you <laughs> present a certain version of yourself. Yeah. 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 So... That brings us to our first discovery. And do you want to tell us a little bit about what your first one is? Your first gold nugget for us. First gold nugget for the audience. Golden nugget. Because the audience are very excited right now. (laughs) (laughs) Jumping up on their seats in traffic. What's the number one? Here we go, everyone. Um, So the first thing I wanted to cover is this. Actually, it kind of goes back to social media, right? Um, This idea of vicarious trauma and what we see in the palm of our hand every day. Um, Okay. So there's, you know, there's some pretty heavy things going on in the world and we we see it, right? We see it um, in the mix of, like, morning news and, you know, people's good life Mm. on Instagram and, you know, then we see something terrible and we don't really have any longitudinal data for what that's like, right? We don't have... Mm. um, generations who have experienced trauma that way even if it is witnessing something that's happening on the other side of the world so I think it only makes sense that our responses to that are going to be messy they're going to be confusing Um, we don't know how to respond but we know that we feel something when we see those things Mm. and they can really affect us that reminds me of the book the body keeps its score and I think in one part of the book they mention um, 9-11 mm-hmm. and the experience um, people that watch the news had all around the world they noticed that a lot of young people old people all started going 
to get psychology sessions just based off watching the visuals of the plane hitting the towers yeah. and that feeling and the trauma it brought through screens, through technology, all across the world. And I think we've heard from a lot of young people recently in the impact of the wars that are going over in Europe at the moment. And that effect is very, very real. Um, and that effect is definitely real for you as well, Dad. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your experience with so, yeah, trauma. So, so having worked in the emergency services area, including army and... Um, just in the fire space and various bits and pieces, there has been times where I myself in the line of duty, so to speak, have been a bit traumatised. And and there was one stage where I could not see, um, for example, I couldn't see um, army movies or bits and pieces like that because I I really loved them before, but after an experience I went through, I couldn't watch watch that. And recently um, there was something I watched and I, because I, I'm, I'm in my wellness journey of, you know, I'm, I'm cruising along quite nicely but every now and then you get your bumps. But yeah. um, I do little things to test myself to build my resilience and one thing I was watching on, on TV with my wife the other day was something that I wouldn't feel usually comfortable with but I felt okay and I watched it. But then, then the next day I pulled up feeling pretty awful and I was like what the hell was that why do I feel so crap today and I I didn't realize that that trauma from what I saw triggered the next day how I felt and for the next few days I felt pretty awesome pretty awful so yeah it's very much alive and well and something that I think people are probably not even aware of yeah. What's going on? Yeah, and how can they be aware if sort of cognitively, you know, it's, yeah. it's not hitting as hard and then it might be something that sort of shows up um, somatically, you know, in, in your body the next day or you might just have, you might feel a bit jilted, you might feel a bit more yeah. irritable. How is that something that you personally manage for yourself? I think that awareness, right, that's always really the first step, like, and that's part of talking about it and normalising it is that... Um, those responses can be so varied and I think it is really valuable to to learn more about um how the body keeps the score you know like Mm. you said it's it's um it can I think it can help us in better understanding ourselves Mm. right if if we can it's not like it's something that you have to like keep really close track of all the time and monitor all the time but if we have that awareness of um all right I'm feeling a little bit off you know, knowing what might have been the trigger for that. It so if you have one of those, like an like an inner movement, I feel like mm. it's probably worthwhile to explore it with maybe a friend or or even yeah. with someone professional if required. But yeah, or, you know, there are things we can do ourselves. Like, you know, our body is, if it's powerful enough to be storing these things, it's, you know, yeah. it's powerful enough to shift them too. And it's good. There's all sorts of things, you know, I'm even just wriggling as I'm talking. You know, there's there's things we can do that really help to to loosen up. That's incredible and thank you for sharing. Tell us a little bit about your second discovery. So my second discovery is certainly something I've been reflecting on um, over the past year. And it's about when friends or when family or partners share something, you know, like they, they mm. share they've had a bad day or... You know, they, they talk about something that's on their mind. I've learned that they really just want you to, to sit with that. They, they want someone to hear them out. It's, it's, such a, it's such a natural thing and, you know, it might be, you know, people listening like, yeah, of, of course, that's, um, that, that's how it works. But I've noticed, um, I think doing the kind of work I do, that I slip I have slipped into work mode in some of those situations, you know, sort of offering solutions or strategies when, yes, those things can be helpful, but they might not be what that person needs at that moment. I've definitely been reflecting on that and I think that... Are you saying so just like being okay with letting people be in pain? Yeah, totally, yeah. Sitting with that, right? And... I guess the irony is that it's so intuitive to me to to be that way, like in my clinical practice. But it's yeah. almost like I notice myself doing it more in the personal relationships. Yeah, so and 
Yeah. And when you had that discovery, mm. obviously as a psychologist, that's your role. Yeah. But in these cases, maybe people didn't want that they role. And how did yeah. that <laughs> affect your ego when you realised that yeah. maybe you're doing the wrong thing? Yeah, oh. right. Um, but I thought I was doing the right thing. Like this is what I trained for. Um, just like you said, if if they wanted a psychologist, they would go see one. And that, that's not what I'm there for, you know, in that moment. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of what I reflected on, I, I realised more what was coming up for me in those moments, right? Like perhaps there was this idea of people would expect more of me, right? Like, oh, well, this is your mm. training, this is your background, like you've got to uh, step it up when I bring a problem to you. It's like, no, I don't. You know, it's, right. it's about being there as, as a friend. And I can imagine that could make you feel a little bit lonely sometimes if you're always feeling like you're the one having to provide the answers and you always have to put on this yeah. I guess jacket that I'm I'm the person helping because when do you really get a chance to be yourself and to to sit in the hole with these people and to connect yeah. in that authentic way how does that and to affect sit. your connection and yeah. authenticity with these people yeah totally I think it's probably something that um I wasn't aware of right and I, I guess that's that's the power of reflection it's you're not really aware of it until you sort of pause and, and notice it um, yeah I think it it's not natural to to be in that state and that's sort of the um, that is the challenge that comes with working in a field that's about the human experience right it's sort of um, in some ways you're in an expert because of your training um because of that being your profession but like we're all experts in the human mm. experience in one way or another too yeah and so we can all care yeah just by genuinely just listening to someone and i mean you can listen but you can listen, listen. and it's like being <laughs> fully present is yeah i think something that's really it it takes a while to learn. Yep. And not Would you agree? I completely agree. And it yeah. take it takes a while to learn and I think probably not through um, academic training, right? It it Yeah. It, you learn that through experience. You and learn that. One thing dad's always done really well is ask the right questions and help mm. a person stumble on the answer themselves. Yes. Not providing advice, but he provides these strategic questions. Mm. He, he already knows the answer and he, and he speaks to the 20% of what he sees and lines you up. So you follow the steps and find and create the map yourself till you find that discovery. And I think that's something that I really appreciated mm. about what you've taught me over the years. How that's would you cool. describe that technique? Um, sometimes lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, there have been many times where I've sat with people over the years and felt like I've done a really lousy job because I go in and start talking and I'm just like, what am I doing right now? And I counsel myself and go, Steve, you know, put the tools back in the pocket and actually just be present. It's not about you or about you feeling good about yourself being a good counsellor. And that's that battle in your head, isn't it? Like to be yeah. present. It's yeah. Or like there's things going out the window or, you know, you're expecting a phone call from a friend and it's hard to sometimes tune in. But I feel like you can, you, when you, someone's you talking, when you're, someone's talking, you have these things that race to your mind and you automatically want to jump in, pr provide this solution. Um, someone once told me when someone's talking and you want to um, just jump in, write that down, write what they've said down or, or write that. Yeah, that's good. The, the action you want to speak about and then come back to it after they've finished talking and, and see if it's still relevant. Yeah. Um, because good. sometimes people actually just need that time yes. to let that out and to yeah. experience the pain or the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, letting them go that, down that path themselves. Mm. Um, yeah, that's good. It's hard. It, I think yeah. it's very hard it's to do. It's powerful. <laughs> um, I remember, um, how are we going with time here? One of the most powerful experiences I had with someone connecting me in grief was when it was actually late and when my dad died. You probably can't remember this. No, I can't, I can't remember that. And um, he was going through his rat bad. So you're, you're going through a pretty, pretty awful what do you mean stage of human... <laughs> 
Um, and um, he, um, my dad died, and I got told at four thirty, five o'clock in the morning, and I went knocked on the boys' rooms. And told them that my dad had died. And I remember Leighton, out of a deep sleep, jumped out of his bed. And he, was, he just sat up and he was like, huh? He said nothing. He just went, huh? And he launched and gave me the biggest bear hug. Mm. And it went for about probably seven or eight minutes. And you said not one thing. And I remember it melted me. And in years of doing work with people, that was profound. Mm. And it was in you automatically mm. and no one needed to teach you it was there and i think we have that capacity yeah. and we shouldn't write ourselves off mm-hmm. because <laughs> we because of our lack of training or experience or lack of words even yeah yes, it's like exactly <laughs> it's like we have that capacity and that fully helped me go into a, a healthier grief cycle when I was disconnected with my dad, but your ability to do that, and we have never spoke about that, have we? Never spoken about that at um, all. Wow. <laughs> and that, would, that was probably eight, ten years ago, but that was one of the most powerful and profound experiences. And I think to be present is a massive gift. And how do you teach that? You know, it's innate, like you yeah, said, right? Yeah, it's in, in it's, us. It's, um, and, you know, in my w- I work with some children and, like, children are experts, so to speak, in that. You know, it's they, they know so much. Yeah. They, they, they know. They're so attuned to what we yeah, might need in that moment. So, yeah, that's a really beautiful story. Yeah, sorry, we just hijacked your question. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad you did. You, you summed it up, right? Um, yeah. yeah, it really makes me think back to... I know, and this is sort of going again into like the training side, but probably one of the biggest yeah. gifts in my training was coming across Carl Rogers and, you know, the concept of unconditional yeah. positive regard. And, you know, that's yeah. something that he um, really drills into his clinical work. But I think in, in the same sense, you know, this unconditional positive regard for others, right? This this belief in our ability to to heal and to be there and... You know, having that positive regard for for ourselves and and for others. That's good. And what you just spoke about before, Dad. Thanks for sharing that. By the way, I really appreciate that. Mm. I think that segues segues quite nicely into our third discovery. Yes, doesn't it, Sandra? It sure does. So, the third discovery is around the loss of my own dad. So, I. I lost my dad at the start of 2020, so coming up mm. four years now. And, you know, grief is such a shared but unique experience. And, you know, we know that we all can respond in so many different ways to something, mm. to a loss, right? Mm. Um, I came across this image once and I wish I could attempt to draw it out or to share it in some way maybe maybe later but you know it's this it's this idea that people tend to think that grief shrinks over time right so if I'm looking at the this image in my head right now and you know there's this glass bottle there you go draw draw it it and and I'll show it to the camera yeah oh good all right sorry for everyone and describe it to people listening as well just yeah yeah all right so what I'm drawing here is I'm drawing three bottles and they're getting a little bit – I'm not doing a very good job. They're meant That's to okay. get a little bit smaller, right? So it's this idea that people think that our grief shrinks over time. Mm. But really what happens is we grow around our grief. Like that grief is what it is. It's still there. It's, yeah, it stays there. And and I've experienced that myself. In, and in many ways, sometimes it becomes... Um, Can I show you? I'll show you the camera. That's a <laughs> Don't show them Progressively that smaller <laughs> circle. <laughs> but we get the drift. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, there can be things that happen that, that activate that grief again, yeah. like in new and more painful ways, right? There yeah, can be yeah. things as an adult that... Um, you know, you think about having having your dad there and that kind of reactivates it. So I think, you know, the reflection there is around, you know, 
for ourselves experiencing grief but also you know for for those that you know that might be experiencing a loss and you know it, it might have been years ago but you know it more than likely more often than not it it's not that it's shrunk over time right it's it's sort of just it Accepting it shifts, it. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, so, gr- and growing around it and building yeah. that padding and insulation of self, yeah. self-discovery, which helps you, I guess, tackle and manage it yes. in, a, in a more structured and safe way. Yeah, you learn about yourself along the way. It doesn't negate the, the loss itself. Yeah. But that pain, that ball of pain still exists Yeah, to a, a very real extent. It's, yeah. it's our ability to kind of step above it and and work around it which is different to some of the older generations like me and my parents and my family where it's just like deal with it yeah speak to someone about it so you can get over it yeah like a loading bar yeah yeah which is like no it's comes you know it's part of you and it's part of your story Um, yeah that's good that's a good i've got a i've got a quote if i may yeah. And I'm probably going to butcher this more than the, that's, that's the drawing. Fine. But, um, you know, if if your life is a book, don't let that loss, that grief be the title of the book, but a really important chapter mm, of the story, right? That's it's good. it's part of who you are, but it doesn't. And that brings me to Leighton Bradfield's signature, signature question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm really passionate about is understanding how we use our mental health discoveries that we learn about and how do we actually make sure we step forward into our life, whether that be one, three, ten years, and make sure that they're integrated properly. So my question, and we can talk about the last discovery, how do you make sure that you keep this discovery going forward into your future? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of advice there's a lot of strategies you know there's no shortage of that we often we know the things that might help but yeah putting them into practice and maintaining that practice is is pretty hard right so I think we need to know what works for us like you need to find those things that do keep you going those anchors um you know even you sort of talking about the importance of reflection um do you have some structure for reflection Mm. in in your week right and do you yeah, I, I do. I think, you know, it, it's something that comes about almost like um, as part of your practice and your studies, um, but you still have to make it your own. So I think through it almost being um, almost a compulsory part mm. to begin with, you you find your own way of doing that, you know, whether it's just some, some time to yourself, writing things down. Um. So discipline is your friend. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that's good. In a healthy yeah. sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, look, that was um we've well, we've had to ru- I feel like we could continue on, but unfortunately we can't. Short and um, sweet. But thank you so much for for sharing with us and um we're going to get you before you go to write a question for our next guest. All right. Um to transition them into a period of deep discussion with us but really thank you so much for just your journey your openness and what you do every day is is a gift so thank you thank you it's been a real pleasure yeah thank you bye